Nice. Okay, so good morning and welcome to this uh, second morning session of ICGT. We have three talks here. The first one will be from uh, Christopher Postkit on incorrectness logic for graph programs. So Christopher, you can start. Sure, thank, thank you very much for the introduction and uh, good afternoon from, from Singapore, in fact. Okay. Uh, so before I sort of try, rather than try and summarize uh, what this, this paper is all about on this uh, title slide, uh, what I'd like to do instead is jump straight into the background a little bit of why I started uh, thinking about, uh, about this kind of problem. Um, so hopefully this is, this is familiar, uh, this, this, this triple over here, this Hoar triple. Um, it's a partial correctness triple and intuitively uh, what it means uh, is that if a program P is executed on a state satisfying uh, this precondition pre, then if P terminates, uh, the state upon its termination will satisfy uh, this post condition post. Uh, so it's kind of reasoning in this direction, if you like. Uh, it's saying regardless of what initial state you executed on, you executed on uh, as long as it satisfies pre, you are guaranteed to satisfy this post condition. Um, so to give you an example of uh, a valid triple under this kind of interpretation, uh, I have a simple program here uh, that takes some variable x and it doubles it. And surely it's the case that if you, if you execute this on a, on a state where x is positive, uh, then when it terminates, uh, x will be larger than minus two. Uh, what I would highlight over here is that this, um, this post condition here is over approximating uh, the post states. So it also um, characterizes some states that you wouldn't reach. For example, x having the value of minus one since it's positive in the beginning. So um, this talk isn't about whole logic. Uh, what it's about is uh, actually taking these triples and uh, thinking about them in the other direction. So this is an idea that was, that was first proposed back in 2011 uh, in an S, uh, SEFM paper by these, by these authors. Um, and so I've, I'm using a slightly different notation here to uh, distinguish this. I'm using square brackets uh, presumption instead of uh, precondition and result instead of postcondition. And uh, the interpretation kind of goes in the other direction. And intuitively what it means uh, is this. Uh, if you have a state that satisfies uh, this result, that satisfies this assertion, then it can be reached by executing P on some state satisfying uh, the presumption. Uh, not all states satisfying the presumption, but there's guaranteed to be uh, at least one. So everything that satisfies this post condition, in a sense, uh, should be reachable. So if I take uh, the triple that I showed on the previous slide, uh, the, same, the same bit of code and the same assertions, um, under this different interpretation, it's not valid. Uh, and the reason it's not valid is because a state where x is equal to minus 1 satisfies this, uh, this post condition, um, but it cannot be reached from any state satisfying uh, the precondition. So in a sense, this is an under approximation uh, of the states that can be reached. It's a subset of the states that can be reached uh, rather than an over approximation in, in classical whole logic. Um, so what's the reason for having any interest in, in, in this kind of thing? Um, so the original motivation uh, that these authors uh, pursued in the reverse whole logic paper, it was really about specifying randomized algorithms. So in other words, proving that uh, all you know, random permutations that you want can actually be reached uh, via different random number streams. Uh, so this was quite a natural way to, to reason about these kinds of algorithms. But skip forward uh, several years and, uh, and Peter O'Hearn over here uh, sort of independently uh, investigated this kind of reasoning uh, from a different perspective. And that was with the goal of proving the presence uh, of bugs. Uh, so there's a duality here to the kind of uh, mantra that, that you would have heard from Dijkstra in the past about proving the, proving the absence of bugs. Here it's really about proving uh, the presence. Uh, and the way uh, that, that he started doing this in what he called an incorrectness logic uh, was by tracking uh, the exit conditions of programs, okay, using this, this symbol over here. Uh, in particular, uh, in, in, in his paper from 2019, uh, he looked at two different exit conditions. One was uh, okay. So a normal uh, exit condition, 
and one was error. So, you know, the, you know, for example, um, trying to access the allocated uh, memory. Um, so basically I, I, I came across this work and thought it was quite interesting and wanted to understand it a little bit better. So I, 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 I thought, well, might this be useful in the context of graph programs uh, where we have lots of uh, non-determinism uh, we, we, we have the possibility of, of different ways of the program exiting. We can exit with a graph. Uh, we can exit with a finite failure uh, if a rule fails to apply. Um, and maybe there might, be, there might be situations where it's useful to sort of prove uh, the presence of, of graph structure, perhaps forbidden or illegal graph structure, uh, as a complement to proving the, the correctness of the, uh, of the whole program. So this was the, the background that, that motivated me to, to look into this. And uh, but before I show you the, um, the incorrectness logic that we developed uh, for graph programs, uh, first of all, I need to uh, talk a little bit about programs and a little bit about uh, assertions. Um, because of course here we're, we're working on some different level of abstraction. Um, you know, our programs are, are, are based on graph transformation rules. Uh, so I want to quickly introduce a, a simple language uh, to facilitate that. And our assertions uh, should, of course, specify properties of our states, uh, which are graphs, you know, rather than a variable store. Okay. Um, so for programs, um, if you've been to GCM and uh, if you've been to ICGT in the past, you will have heard about languages like uh, GP2, uh, the recipes of Groove, uh, all of these, uh, and, and, and many other different approaches you can have to sort of programmatically manipulate uh, graphs. So the one that, uh, that I have in this paper is, is quite rudimentary. It's, uh, it's a lot simpler than uh, you know, these full-fledged, uh, more practical uh, graph programming languages. And this was just to keep the paper uh, self-contained, uh, you know, focusing on incorrectness reasoning itself. Uh, but we do, too, we do have a, a similar core. So first of all, um, our unit of computation is the rule schema application. Um, and in particular, uh, our nodes are labeled over lists of expressions. We just simplify it a bit by limiting them to integer expressions uh, only. And uh, semantically, the rule applications are based on DPO, but with uh, relabeling. So DPO with relabeling. Uh, to give you an example of a, of a rule schema, um, here's a very simple one. We have on the left-hand side, we're matching two nodes. Uh, both of those nodes are required to have the same integer label. Uh, the first node over here should be incident to a loop. And uh, the effect of the rule is to preserve the nodes, delete this edge, create a new edge from the first node to the second. And then you see we have an expression here on the right where the value of X uh, is doubled. So of course this is um, representing potentially, uh, yeah, potentially infinitely many concrete rules uh, for all the possible integers that you might have in your concrete graph. Um, so along with a rule scheme application, you know, our rudimentary language, it has some control constructs of the standard kind. Uh, first of all, uh, we have rule, sch uh, rule schema set application. So a set of rules, and one of them is non-deterministically applied to the current graph. Uh, we have some uh, sequential composition of, of programs. Uh, we have as long as possible iteration of, of, of rule sets. So keep applying a, a set of rules over and over again until you can apply them no more, exit the iteration. And then we have a conditional construct over here where the branch is chosen according to the applicability of the rule set in the guard. Um, so this is a simple thing. I have a, I have a simple program here to sort of uh, uh, demonstrate it. And it's, uh, it's, it's simple and intentionally uh, buggy. So the idea is it's supposed to compute some kind of graph coloring, you know, assigning uh, integers uh, or natural numbers to all of your nodes such that no two adjacent nodes have the same uh, number. The same coloring. So it does this by uh, through two rules. It applies init exactly once, and then it applies uh, color for as long as it remains applicable. So the idea here is you take some integer labeled node, uh, you assign uh, it a color of zero using this sort of list syntax, uh, and then your color rule here that's iterated over, it keeps matching any node with a color and a node adjacent that doesn't have one and uh, then it assigns a color by incrementing uh, the color on the left-hand node. Um, so in principle, a simple program, but it's, and, and it can sometimes give you a correct coloring. You know, in this example over here, we have uh, three nodes all labeled uh, with the same integer. And uh, it's possible 
to run this program and get this graph as an outcome. Uh, so uh, a color of zero, color of one, color of two. So properly colored uh, version of the graph. Uh, it's also possible to, to, to determine, yep, uh, depending on the non-determinism, uh, to get this graph as an outcome, which is not properly colored because of these two adjacent nodes. Uh, it's also possible that uh, if you apply it to a graph that doesn't have any integer labeled node, for example, the empty graph, uh, you get as an outcome uh, some finite failure, which may not be something you want because arguably uh, the empty graph is already properly colored. So this is a simple program to il illustrate it with a, with a couple of uh, seeded faults in it already. So we'll come back to this one uh, in a little bit. Uh, what I want to add now is, is just something about the semantics of it. Um, because we, we, we need a semantics to be able to reason about uh, the soundness and the completeness uh, of this incorrect, uh, incorrectness logic once we get to it. Um, so for the semantics of graph programs, uh, what I did here uh, was propose essentially a simple uh, relational denotational semantics. And the idea was, was to associate every program uh, with two functions uh, for the two exit conditions of, of graph programs. Uh, one for tracking uh, normal executions where you get a, a graph as the outcome. And so I used okay for here. And one for tracking uh, finite failure uh, where fail is the outcome. And I used ER for here. Uh, probably in, in if we, you know, should we extend this work, uh, I kind of regret the choice of error here because it's, you know, finite failure isn't necessarily an abnormal outcome. It's not like a, uh, accessing the allocated memory. So we'll probably change this to something like uh, F or FF in the future. Uh, but the point is we have these two different uh, exit conditions that we can track and we want to be able to reason about later. Um, so intuitively what the semantic function means, if we consider the OK case, uh, we have a pair of graphs, G and H, uh, belonging to this uh, if H is reachable from G uh, via the program P. Okay, So if there's an execution of P on G that gives you H, then you will find this in this set. Um, for the other case, the finite failure case, uh, it's slightly more complicated. Essentially, GH uh, belongs to this uh, if H is the last proper graph derived from G in some execution that ultimately fails. And it could fail either immediately at the beginning or part of the way through, depending on what the program is. Um, but essentially, H is the last proper graph uh, before the failure occurs. So that's the intuition of these, of these semantic functions. Um, to give you a little uh, insight into, what, into how it was defined, uh, I've got the rules here from the paper, and I would just draw your attention to some particular aspects of it. Uh, so at the top here, we have the, uh, the definition of, of rule set application. Uh, first of all, for the OK case where the, where the rule can be applied, we have pairs of graphs where H can be directly derived from G via R, so intuitively what we want. Uh, for the finite failure case, we have pairs of the same graph uh, where the rule set cannot be applied to it. Uh, sequential composition over here, it looks a bit uh, complicated, but it's, it, it's not really. It's just um, a compact representation of, of, of all of the possible cases. Um, so first of all, it's covering the case where uh, P uh, might execute OK, uh, but Q either fails or executes OK. And then the other case where failure occurs in P directly. So it collects all of these different cases together. Um, for rule set application over here, um, first of all, I'd look at the finite failure case. So this is the empty set because uh, rule set application never fails. Uh, if, a rule, if the rule within the iteration can't be applied, the iteration simply exits. Um, in this case over here, over the OK case, uh, essentially we collect uh, uh, the pairs where the, where the rule uh, iteration exits and also a single step unfolding here each time. Um, so ultimately this, this, this semantics is uh, handling things like non-termination implicitly. It's keeping it, uh, trying to keep it a bit simple there. Uh, so if you have a rule that, for example, the empty graph uh, being written, rewritten to the empty graph, you apply that using as long as possible iteration, it never terminates, uh, the function will give you the, uh, the empty set, okay? Uh, so it's handled implicitly rather than a, an explicit uh, symbol like bottom. So that's our semantics. Uh, that's an example of programs. Uh, I want to also briefly mention what the assertions are, because as I say, uh, we're operating on graphs. 
Uh, so we need uh, some way of, of expressing properties of graphs. And essentially what I've used over here uh, are the, the nested conditions uh, which have been explored by, uh, by, by people like Harbel and, and Penniman. Uh, I also looked at them in the past, extending them with expressions. Um, so essentially they're, they're nested morphisms equipped with expressions uh, over the labels. So to give you, I, I don't want to introduce it formally, but to give you the gist of what these look like, we have some property over here that's essentially expressing uh, for all pairs of uh, integers and uh, for all nodes labeled by those integers, uh, if those integer labels are, oops, my apologies, if those integer labels are, are different, uh, then it's the case that those nodes are adjacent to each other. Um, so in this notation, this morphism-based notation, there's actually a, a lot of syntactic sugar and, and abbreviations uh, in, this, in this example. You know, really you have a, a chain of morphisms. So if I write it out a bit more fully, you can see here uh, that we have a morphism from the empty graph to this one. Uh, the co-domain over here is the domain of the, of the nested part uh, and so on. Um, so as I say, I don't want to, to, to formally de uh, define that in the, in, in the talk, um, but essentially it's a, it's a morphism-based notation. It's equivalent to first-order logic, um, which actually makes it quite limited. Uh, first-order logic initially sounds good, but in the context of graphs, it means you can only express local properties. You can't talk about arbitrary length paths, um, which are actually, this is really limiting. So I would refer you to Gia's talk uh, later in this session about more powerful logics. So we have our graph programs, we have our assertions. I wanna talk about then uh, incorrectness logic uh, in this context. Uh, so first of all, uh, I took the, uh, the triple uh, that, we had, uh, that we had before, and I, I wanted to give it a uh, validity and meaning in the context of programs. So suppose that we have these nested conditions or E conditions, C and D. We have some exit condition, which is OK or ER for finite failure, and we have a graph program. So this triple is valid if the following holds. If for every graph H uh, satisfying D, uh, there exists some graph G satisfying C, and uh, GH exists in the semantic function uh, for that exit condition. Okay, so the, the emphasis here is uh, we're sort of quantifying over all of the graphs that satisfy uh, this post assertion. Uh, if it's valid, we can always find some graphs satisfying this uh, that derives H via P. So it's quite different to the uh, original Hall semantics. It's the dual. And the idea of the work, the idea of the paper was basically to propose some deductive rules for proving valid triples of this kind. Um, so I'm going to show you a few of those rules just to sort of uh, give the gist of, of, of what we did. Um, you know, here I have a couple of rules, a couple of proof rules for sequential composition. So if we want to prove a triple, uh, P followed by Q, uh, then we have to prove uh, two separate triples about P and Q. Uh, you can see here that uh, uh, this particular rule on the left is handling the case where P executes OK and Q either is OK or finitely fails. Uh, on the right, you see a, a, another version where actually the finite failure occurs already in P. So we need two separate rules here. Um, for if then else, it's pretty similar, except we also have this, uh, uh, this condition over here, which expresses the applicability uh, of this rule set. Uh, so I don't want to give the definition of this in the talk, but essentially this is expressing uh, that R is applicable, thus we choose this branch. This rule I quite like. So this, is, uh, this really shows that, that uh, this under approximate reasoning is the jewel of, uh, of Hall logic, um, because it's in this rule of consequence, the, the arrows here, the implications are reversed. Uh, so rather than uh, 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 D prime implying D, uh, we have D uh, implying D prime. So in other words, we're strengthening the post condition. And what this allows you to do is actually soundly uh, discard uh, paths, soundly discard uh, disjuncts, uh, which may be quite useful for scalability purposes. Some other rules that, are, that, are, that we have for iteration. Uh, we have a rule over here for the case where zero iterations occur. Um, so in other words, if you have a, a post state where the rule set is inapplicable, uh, you know, then you can prove this because, of course, uh, then you can prove the same, um, the same invariant, essentially, uh, because the rule set would never be implied. Okay, uh, So essentially, invariants are less important here in the context of incorrectness reasoning. 
Uh, if the rule set is applied, we have a different rule altogether. Uh, you can see here there's a, you know, one step of the iteration is, is, is unfolded. Um, and if we combine these rules together, uh, we have a, a more general iteration rule um, that talks about multiple steps. Now, in the context of this work, this rule is, is a bit less satisfying because uh, you need to know how many iterations uh, uh, you, need to, you want to reason about, n iterations. Uh, if you look at the work of uh, in the, the reverse for logic work or, or Hearn's paper, uh, they have a, a more general uh, uh, in, uh, variant iteration rule uh, that we can use. Uh, but unfortunately, this would require in our context a more powerful logic or uh, would require us to allow infinite assertions. So we have this uh, slightly more, somewhat more limited version here instead. Um, at the core of this, uh, this calculus, we have, of course, our rule applications. Uh, we have the case where the rule set uh, fails. Uh, so you can see here, we have our finite failure tag. Uh, and uh, if it fails, uh, you know, whatever was holding of the last proper graph, we carry forward. Um, and we have rule set succeeding. Um, so in this case, uh, you know, we have a transformation here to construct a weakest uh, post condition. So this is quite different from the, uh, the work that I did in the past and the work uh, of Harvard Penniman, where, where we were really concerned about constructing weakest preconditions. Uh, here, we're constructing a weakest postcondition. Um, and essentially, it mirrors uh, what was done in all of this previous work, except it goes in the other direction. Uh, you know, we start with some uh, pre-assertion uh, pre C. Uh, we shift it using the, uh, you know, the shifting lemmata uh, onto the left-hand side of the rule. Uh, we then essentially apply the rule uh, to it, if you like, uh, to get it over the right hand side of the rule. And then we existentially quantify it uh, over possible co-matches of R. Uh, so it's really uh, the mirror of, 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 of the weakest precondition construction for, for rule sets. Uh, I don't want to give the technical definition here, but just a little bit of intuition. Uh, if, we, if we take uh, this idea and we take a possible assertion C, which is saying that we have an integer labeled node such that there's uh, no uh, colored node in the graph. And then we take a, a, a rule like this uh, in it, which is initializing some node. If we construct uh, W post over, over this rule and uh, this assertion, uh, then we get something like this. So I wanna highlight here that uh, we're quantifying over the, over the co-match of the rule essentially. And then the nested part is basically all the ways that uh, C can kind of overlap with it. So it's, it's very similar to sort of these well-known constructions that we've looked at in the past, but going in the other direction. Okay, so our technical results uh, for this calculus, first of all, these rules are sound. So if you can prove something using these rules, uh, it's sound according to under approximate validity. Uh, they're relatively complete uh, also. Um, I have a couple of examples just to give the gist of, of how this goes about. Uh, we have this program again, uh, and I mentioned, of course, uh, it's possible for it to fail uh, if you don't have a, 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 a graph uh, with an integer labeled node. And so, of course, this is a simple property of it, but we can, we can prove it. Um, so if we take this triple over here that asserts uh, that, uh, you know, we, we exit in finite failure and, um, you know, the, the, the init rule is inapplicable, um, then we can prove this using the proof rules. So this is obviously, this is a very simple one because we get this directly uh, from the rule set failure uh, axiom, okay? It happens right at the beginning when you, when you don't have the presence of an integer labeled node. Uh, we can prove the, the presence of a legal structure. This one's a little bit more interesting. Um, so here uh, on the left-hand side, I'm asserting that actually there is a node that's ready to be colored, so we won't <laughs> fail. Uh, this is saying that we exit uh, normally with a graph and uh, in particular, it's saying that in the graph, there will be some illegal coloring, two nodes of the same color that are adjacent. Uh, it's saying that there will be some color uh, that is zero. And it's saying that color uh, is no longer applicable, meaning that we have a, that the loop is terminated. Um, so in the paper, we have a, 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 a proof tree that looks something like this. I don't want to go over the details, but kind of highlights this aspect of it. So this, this common pattern, uh, where we need to discharge an implication. Uh, so illegal uh, is essentially this part of the assertion uh, that there's an illegal coloring and uh, we need to show that it implies this weakest post condition. 
So it's really uh, analogous to what we were doing in uh, partial correctness reasoning. Uh, but instead of imply, showing that we imply a weakest precondition, we show that we imply a weakest post condition instead. Now, this was also, this was interesting for me, but also somewhat uh, disappointing when I started understanding it a bit better. Uh, because I, I started, I started uh, exploring why this triple is actually valid, and it wasn't uh, for the reason I first thought. Um, so if you take, for example, uh, this assertion over here, this is satisfied by this graph. Okay, so it's satisfied by this graph earlier, which is improperly colored. Um, but remember the definition of under, under approximate validity, it has to be uh, possible to derive it by some graph that satisfies the pre-assertion. And an example of a graph that satisfies it is this one here, uh, where the uh, illegal coloring already exists. Okay, so of course, init is applied and then job done. Uh, you know, color never executes. Um, so this isn't uh, this is this is valid, but not due to uh, the bug in color, uh, rather due to the post condition not being uh, strong enough in a sense. Uh, so it's possible to fix, and in the paper we have a, a stronger post condition that helps expose the issue in color. Uh, but then we start it, you start seeing that actually uh, the the limitation of the logic we're using this first order logic. Uh, means you can't prove um, very deep properties. In, in particular, you want to be able to prove that uh, uh, that some coloring, uh, some illegal coloring happens, uh, but without going beyond first order logic, you're limited to colorings of certain lengths of loops. Um, so this is sort of illustrating to me the importance of looking at, at, at stronger logics. And again, Gia's talk is coming up. Um, so that's really a, a, an overview of, 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 of what we have in the paper. Um, some possible applications and possible reasons to be interested in this. Uh, I think it could be an interesting complement to whole logic proofs. You know, if you can't prove the absence of bugs, if you can't find uh, that loop invariant, uh, then maybe switch to the other side of the coin and start reasoning about the circumstances that cause bugs, because maybe your program is buggy. Uh, you know, the two sides of the coins I imagine could complement each other in quite a satisfying way, should you have the tools. Um, another, to another suggestion which comes uh, from, from Peter O'Hearn's paper is to recast uh, static bug catchers, so tools based on symbolic execution, et cetera, uh, in terms of finding under approximation proofs. So give a soundness argument uh, for bug catching. Uh, so that's something that could be quite interesting. And uh, maybe it makes sense in the graph or the model transformation context. Uh, and of course, it needs to be made more practical. Uh, our language is quite rudimentary. Our, our, our assertion language is quite uh, limited. And uh, it's not necessarily straightforward to apply. So maybe we need some more derived rules to make it easier to facilitate uh, proofs. Um, so that's all I wanted to say. Uh, we have an incorrectness logic for graph programs, exploring under approximate reasoning. Uh, we can prove the reachability of failure, illegal structure. It's sound, relatively complete. And uh, we have some simple proofs. Uh, but the, these proofs also highlight that there's more to be done. And uh, finally, uh, you know, it's durian season in Singapore. I was going to put a photo of the university here, but uh, I, I thought I'll, 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 uh, I'll end with a picture of our fruit uh, since it's the time of year. If you ever come visit in June uh, onwards, I'll treat you to it. <laughs>